Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Stone, the Marketing and Communications Manager at Downtown Cleveland Alliance. And I'd like to thank you for joining DCA for the Downtown Now webinar series in partnership with Cleveland Magazine. After the panel discussion, we will have a Q&A session. Throughout the webinar, you are welcome to submit your questions using the Q&A button on the menu bar. This way we will have questions queued up and ready to go to start the Q&A. Also feel free to utilize the chat box uh, and we will do our best to address your comments uh, throughout the broadcast. We may also uh, ask a few questions in the chat as well. So feel free to respond in any way. I will now turn it over to our Executive Vice President for Business Development, Michael Diemer. Thank you, Jonathan. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, familiar with Downtown Cleveland Alliance, uh, I wanted to share a little bit about who we are and what we do. We are the only nonprofit organization dedicated solely to making Downtown Cleveland the, region, the region's most compelling place to live, work, and play. We are a place-based development organization that represents property owners, residents, businesses of all sizes, as well as civic partners in downtown Cleveland. Over the last 15 years, we've concentrated on building a pedestrian-friendly environment that uh, attracts additional investment, a place where residents and office workers can walk to meet their daily needs, where local retailers and restaurateurs animate the streets, where people are proud to build a life for themselves and their families. We can't do this work without the generous support of individuals, businesses, corporate partners, and foundations. Downtown Cleveland needs your support now more than ever. And in response to an outpouring of support, a request for ways to help, DCA has launched the Unite Clea Fund. Donations to this fund help support small businesses, aid our Voices of Clea public mural program, expand our SEEDS workforce readiness program that provides jobs and job training for individuals who are homeless, and sustains our Downtown Cleveland Homeless Fund that helps connect individuals who are homeless with needed shelter and services. As Jonathan mentioned, this is the 21st episode of the Downtown Now webinar series, and we've used the webinar to chronicle downtown's response to the pandemic, as well as the movement for racial equity. And today we turn our attention to that struggle for greater equity and inclusion, as we have a number of times throughout the summer. At Downtown Cleveland Alliance, we believe that leading on issues of equity and inclusion is the long overdue right thing to do. We know that it's an economic imperative in order to develop, attract, and retain the talent that our downtown wants and that our businesses need. We also understand that the words are easy, but the work is hard, uh, and there is so much, so much work to be done. Today, we'll talk about some of the issues our community is facing, some of the things that are being done to achieve greater equity and inclusion, and uh, hopefully, some additional things that we can all do to build a more inclusive community on the other side of COVID-19. And we have a really incredible panel today for this conversation. I'd like to introduce uh, Teresa Metcalf Beasley uh, from McDonald Hopkins, uh, where she chairs the public law division. Uh, she's also a member of the DCA board of directors and chairs the Downtown Cleveland Alliance Racial Equity and Inclusion Committee. Welcome, Teresa. Thank uh, you, Michael. We're joined uh, as well by Larice Purnell, uh, the managing partner of CLE Consulting, uh, as well as the founder of The Real Black Friday. Uh, and finally, we're joined by uh, Marsha Maccabee, President and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Cleveland. Uh, welcome, Larice and Marsha. Thank you, Marcia. For having me. Well, I, I'd, I'd like to uh, begin by uh, trying to set some context for uh, the discussion we're having in, in Cleveland uh, as, as well as nationally. And, you know, as, as I think back to where Cleveland was in, in May, uh, where the country was uh, in the aftermath of the, the protests around George Floyd's murder, um, I know it, it, as I watched all that unfold in Cleveland and nationally, you know, one of the things I was initially very concerned about was what I felt like was probably the inevitable backlash. And, and I guess by that, I mean uh, a, a, a crackdown on, on uh, protesting and unwillingness to deal with uh, underlying issues that had, had festered uh, for a long, long time, not just in this community, uh, but across our country. And I was, uh, for myself, pleasantly surprised at uh, the coming together that I saw in Cleveland, uh, the diversity of 
uh, people I, I saw uh, in Cleveland, in our suburbs, around the state, uh, coming out to express support for uh, tackling racial equity and, and inclusion. And I, I, I don't, that, and that reaction is for me persisted throughout the summer. I, I think, I, I feel uh, cautiously optimistic about how uh, uh, a lot of folks in our community have come together to uh, uh, engage in what we've called on this webinar, uh, a reckoning. And I wanted to get uh, your reactions uh, to that and, you know, kind of get your sense of whether this moment feels different uh, than when we've had uh, uh, the, the need to address uh, uh, racial equity in the past, when those opportunities have arisen. Uh, and Marsha, I'd, I'd like to begin with you. Certainly, thank you for that opportunity, Michael. So um, let me give a bit of a historical perspective on this. Uh, I think that's where I'd like to start on this. So it's been since the 1960s in the, so during the civil rights moment, uh, movement when the kind of coming together of people from across the country, from various religious perspectives, uh, ethnic groups uh, and all of that because of a moral response to something that felt so horribly wrong in this country. That's really what I believe we saw with the, my, the um, uh, Mr. Floyd's, the George Floyd killing, is people were shocked, they were outraged, and felt that it was so morally wrong for what this country should be about that we needed to come together around making a statement about that. And so really, um, it's been a long time since the country had that kind of coming together around that, probably the last really coming together in a, a very moral outpouring and, and a very cohesive outpouring was around 9-11. But I think that for many of our millennials and many who did not experience the civil rights, this was really their civil rights moment. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are a lot um, of pieces around that. And you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement as a key foundation under this, um, I think to see people coming around or coming together around that mantra um, was even a little bit surprising to me. Not coming together around a response to the George Floyd killing, but coming together around the Black Lives Matter mantra. And, um, and I think, and certainly that has caused both a lot of togetherness in our community, while at the same time, some separations. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happened during the 60s as well. So I think that really the important thing is now, what do we do with this collective energy? What do we do with this collective kind of rethinking our moral response to what we want our country to be? And how do we then put action behind that? And so you see a lot of our cities and our counties really coming forward saying, you know, Racism is a public health crisis and we need a real response to that. So you see a number of other parallel ripple uh, kinds of activities evolving around this notion that are geared towards getting us from just the collective voice and the statement about what's important to moving towards some action that can begin to change the landscape that got us here in the first place. Well, I, I, think, I think that's a, a, a great foundation for us to uh, begin today's conversation. And Larisse, I'd, I'd like to you know, ask you to, to build on Marsha's opening and you know, share some of uh, your, your thoughts about um, where we are and, and you know, whether this moment feels different than uh, others you've experienced or uh, in, our, in our history. One, I want to thank you for the opportunity um, to allow me to be here today. And then 
Um, I, you know, I'm a little upset that you make me go behind a legend right now. <laughs> and Teresa, <laughs> uh, but um, it was so well said um, by Ms. Mockaby. Um, but, you know, what I felt like, you know, when we think about technology, um, that when she mentioned millennials, the reality is technology has changed this generation where now what has been happening since the 60s is being televised and, and within seconds, right, in our finger, at our fingertips. And I think that a lot of when you think about the younger generations, what they feel felt it was you've been poking at a bear um, and it was just time for that bear to react. And they've been watching and they've been seeing these things happen very readily at their fingertips. And, and it really, they felt, again, it was time for them to do something. And, and just like the civil rights movement, when we talk about it, and Ms. Mockaby talked about that, they felt that it was their time to get involved from a community perspective and not be led by what they would call the system or institutions that it would take them to infuse change. Um, so just like you saw the killings happen publicly of so many um, people that look like us all on this call today, um, they wanted to make sure that they their voices were heard publicly, just like those killings were, you know, public, um, I would say, segments um, of time. So, so again, I, I do think just like that, um, that the community is woke now. Um, but the most important thing is, um, and I think I said this to Teresa yesterday, is that we don't get rocked back to sleep. Um, that, that now that we're woke, we got to put some action in place. And I think if you look throughout the country, I would give an example of the Million Man March. I think all you saw was that be divided across the nation because there were millions in the streets all across this country and people are ready to activate and make change in their country. So they're just looking for leaders to really lead them into what the next steps are. So panels like this and uh, making sure we put the right information are gonna be imperative, so. I, I, think, I think that that's all very well said as well, Larise. And, and Teresa, I'd like to you know, ask you to close out this opening question and, and share, share your thoughts about you know, what Marsha and, and Larise have, have shared and, and on you know, the, the events of the last several months. Well, thank you for letting me respond last because I knew they would make remarkable statements that I could just piggyback on. And I would say, Michael, for me, it wasn't George Floyd's murder was the tip of the iceberg. It really started that weekend when um, Amy Cooper and the whole bird um, dog issue in Central Park and to see her use her white female privilege mm -hmm. against a black male. That is something I experience in corporate. I experience everywhere and a lot of us do. So for that to happen and watching the news and seeing the video club, it, I was just, I was speechless. And then the murder of George Floyd. As Larisse said, we are now awoke. And going back to even what Marsha said, in Selma, Alabama in the 60s, when they showed the dogs attacking those mm -hmm. innocent people crossing the bridge, mm -hmm. we came together. And Larisse, you're right. Some of us, we gotten content, comfortable in this space. And now we're no longer comfortable. We're no longer going to remain silent. Mm -hmm. What happened with George Floyd's murder on top of the pandemic and its impact on communities of color, it's just like everything just keeps, continues mm -hmm. to snowball. And we just simply, it's not the time to be silent. And you saw people from Cleveland all over the world standing up in unity and it was diverse and that was very moving and we have to keep that momentum going as Larissa was saying we need leaders to continue to activate us and lead us and it may be your own small group you may not be a leader on national television um, but in your own community with your peers you are a leader and we as leaders all of us on this call all of us all of us participating it's time for us to make a difference the time is now. Well, Teresa, th thank you for adding the additional context because I, I think it is easy to, you know, kind of use George Floyd's murder as a shorthand for, you know, a whole set of injustices. Um, 
and, and you know the the, the situation in, in, in Central Park with Amy Cooper is uh, it's easy to forget that was that was part of the context of, of, of the moment. So thank you for for taking us back there and, and adding that. Uh, Marsha, I'd like to circle back to uh, to you. Uh, you know, Larice uh, and Teresa both talked about the uh, the, the need for action in uh, in light of uh, everything that's taking place. And when I think of the Urban League of Greater Cleveland, I, I think of action. Uh, and I know there's a lot of work uh, going on there. I wondered if you could, you know, we could probably spend the hour talking about the work at the, at the Urban League, uh, but if you could, you know, talk about some of the, the key initiatives uh, that you're uh, working on, particularly in, in this uh, environment that we're in in 2020. Certainly. So the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, we have our programmatic thrusts that are focused on education and youth development, workforce development, and entrepreneurship. But I think what's important in terms of the context of this conversation is they're all undergirded by social justice and civil rights. And so, you know, very, very critical. We've been involved at a leadership level in working with the Secretary of State around the upcoming 2020 election. Uh, we're a part of the diversity empowerment committee uh, working alongside of uh, Secretary Frank LaRose. Additionally, we were part of the state of Ohio's 2020 commission as far as the census was concerned in which we're all very disappointed at the shortening uh, of the census. And in fact, our national organization, the National Urban League actually filed a suit um, against the Census Commission regarding not honoring the additional time through October 30th that had been posed in response to the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. So um, really, when you think about what's happened with the pandemic, our normal service delivery platform has really been um, stretched and um, really challenged to serve more because of the pandemic. And we closed our doors on March 18th and began to move to a strictly um, technology format of delivery of services. And the interesting thing is that our service delivery numbers tripled as a result of serving via our technology platform because people didn't have to go out anywhere to, to participate. And, uh, and, and people were looking for help, uh, especially our business owners in terms of the uh, PPP, uh, payroll protection plan and the idle loans. They had you know, needed help on how to apply for those. And I'll tell you, we held uh, session after session, Zoom session, Facebook Live, all of those things to help people to be able to navigate through that information and apply so that they could be helped to keep their businesses going. And now we're still meeting with business to say, you know, how have you pivoted during this time? How do you continue to pivot and be able to keep your business moving along with adjustments that you have to make based on what's happening in the environment? Um, I will also say that being called upon because of our um, social justice and um, you know, racial um, equity lenses, you know, we've been called to lead in many areas, as I mentioned, with the racism as a public health crisis. And so the Urban League is a co-chair of the city's initiative. And we're also working very closely uh, with Chairman Eddie Taylor, who's working with the uh, county's effort uh, on uh, the, the civil group that's working to help the city to look at its practices and its policies with respect to, to, to equity and how to look for race, racism within those systems and to call it out and to figure out how do we change practices and policies that have just been able to move along for years and years and just have become, become a norm. And as uh, Teresa mentioned, the whole bringing out the notion that white privilege and power are part of those systems. 
And how do we get people to recognize that and not, you know, what we're not looking at is calling people personally bad people for doing that, but that those systems cannot be allowed to continue if we want true equity and if we want our systems to treat people in an equitable way. So the Urban League is, is, is being stretched, but I'm proud and happy to say that our capacity, that also that our funders are stepping up to the plate and saying, we're asking a lot more of you and we're willing to support you in order to help grow your capacity so that you can be more uh, for the community. And so I'm, I'm very proud um, to see that that truth is, is really coming to the fore and that we're seeing different kinds of um, giving practices uh, from our philanthropic community in that way. Well, I, I really appreciate you, uh, all, the, all the work the Urban League is doing, but especially uh, elaborating on the, the issue of uh, you know, Cleveland passing uh, an ordinance uh, earlier this summer to recognize uh, racism as a public health issue. And you know, when I, I think about ways in which the community came together uh, earlier in the summer, it's one of the examples I, I think of. You know, I, I was pleased that that our organization was uh, a, a catalyst in bringing uh, others aboard in signing on to a statement endorsing uh, the 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 city's decision to embrace uh, recognizing racism as a public health issue. Uh, in many ways, that was the easy part. Now, now is the hard part of. Of, of grinding it out. Absolutely. So I, <laughs> so I, I, I appreciate. <laughs> I, I appreciate the uh, uh, you, you <laughs> elaborating on that and, and the leadership role that the Urban League is playing in it. Uh, Larissa, one of uh, uh, there's so many things we, I, I could ask you about as well. Um, I, I guess I'd like to begin uh, by making sure that the audience is familiar with uh, the work that you've done over the last several years as a founder of uh, the Real Black Friday and what that is all about and where you see it headed. Yeah, um, I want to thank you for the question. Um, so the Real Black Friday was started in 2014 as an organization um, and a, with a purpose of bringing awareness to black owned businesses um, here and within the community and throughout Northeastern Ohio, as well as create networking and educational opportunities and partner with people like the Urban League uh, that already has a lot of these programs in place. Um, and I, I'll tell you, I'm, I, I was, I'm elated to hear, you know, one that Ms. Maccabee talks about, you know, the program's capacity and the support she's receiving. Um, because I'll tell you in this place we are today, um, it's overwhelming. Um, when, when she says tripled um, what, what the needs were prior to this, that's what we're experiencing. Um, the calls were again, I mean, even from when it comes down to the PPP, um, you'll be surprised the average small black owned business in this community um, prior to this did not have access to a business banker. And you may say, well, most businesses have that access. So if their relationship is with the teller um, and the banks are closed, who do they call? So then they became an access issue. So, so of course, then our phones blew up. How, how do we find access to PPP? You know, um, and how do we get access to funding to make sure that we're able to maintain and, imagine, uh, and manage our workforce? But then I also, um, I have to mention, Michael, um, CLE Consulting Firm, which I'm the partner here. Uh, we became a triage center. I talked to my, my mentors about it and they said, what do you mean by that? Um, I, I felt like during this pandemic as a small black owned business, which CLE is um, as well, um, we were having to answer the calls of businesses we traditionally wouldn't have answered calls to prior to where they didn't think they needed access to an accounting um, because of the documentation requirements. So uh, truly, uh, we had to play a lot of defense versus offense, and, and it created a capacity issue for us because, of course, like Mr. Maccabee, we want to help the community. Uh, we want to do the best we can to provide a certain service. But the reality is just like the banks were overwhelmed, like the SBA was overwhelmed. Um, no one was ready for the pandemic. Uh, they were, um, God bless them, <laughs> but we weren't. Um, so I would say the work is, is very vast um, and, and we're here to, to kind of get in the fight. But I, I would say 
after this is over, the organizations are going to be needed even more. But just like we asked, and I heard Mrs. Mockaby say, um, we asked the businesses, how are they pivoting? Organizations will have to become disruptors in their own industry and learn how to pivot themselves in order to be able to handle uh, what's going to be the new form business after this pandemic is over. I appreciate that overview. And, and Larissa, I apologize. I failed to mention uh, that you have also graciously joined our, our Racial Equity Inclusion Committee uh, at DCA. Thank and, you. And, uh, a, a grateful for you um, uh, bringing your perspective, not just to the webinar, but to that committee's work. Uh, Teresa, you hold a lot of leadership positions in, in the community and you have graciously uh, accepted the, uh, the opportunity and challenge of chairing our racial equity and inclusion committee. So, so thank you for that. Uh, and I'd like to ask uh, you, again, from your, your perspective in a number of leadership roles, but in particular uh, through your, your work with uh, our, our committee at Downtown Cleveland Alliance, you know, what are, what do you see as the opportunities for uh, that committee's work on behalf of DCA, on behalf of downtown, uh, and, and what are your hopes for it? So thanks for the question, Michael. Before I respond, I want to follow up, um, make a comment to one of Marcia's earlier comments about the census and the fact that you know, the deadline was extended, they stopped. But if you talk to... Um, Congresswoman Fudge, and I remember this two years ago, she, she talked about how grossly underfunded the census would be for this year. So we already, we started with the negative and then the pandemic. So how many households have not been counted? Um, just, they don't have the technology to do it online. Right. They don't have the internet service, the connectivity, but we started with the negative, with the sensitive. Um, I won't touch on the politics of that, but that's important to think about with respect to the census. And when we talk about the PPP loans, you know, we just co-hosted a webinar with the President's Council because businesses are asking, will my loan be forgiven? Right. And if not, what happens? So right. it's a lot of details and no one's made it easy for the small business owners, even the large ones. Um, it's just not as an easy fix or easy to respond to as one would think it would be in this era. So just mm -hmm. more, more layers that we have to deal with as small business owners. And with respect to the Racial Equity and Inclusion Committee at um, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, I'm excited about it. What are the possibilities, opportunities? I think they're endless, Michael. Why? Because if you look at the number of minority-owned businesses in downtown Cleveland, it's what, under five? And we have about 40-something businesses. So when conventions come, large conferences, those my small business owners lose out, of, out on those opportunities of being located in the central business district. So the committee was formed um, as a result of what's been going on. And as many people on the board have said, we should have been doing this a long time ago. Yeah. We've gathered some really creative and folks in downtown Cleveland who care about downtown and expanding opportunities for all minorities. Minorities. And so my goal, my personal goal is to create more businesses downtown. I would love to create a fund to help train small business owners, be it retail restaurants, but we have Tri-C, we have the Urban League, we have so many leaders in the field mm -hmm. and people do wanna bring their businesses downtown. They do wanna take advantage of those opportunities and working with Larissa and his group that from the Real Black Fridays, how many have can open storefronts? Um, and as you know, back in, um, well, the old days, not really, so, but during the holidays, you could go to the malls and there were pop-up shops. Mm -hmm. Why can't we do that for small business owners downtown? That's mm -hmm. so easy. And I'm not in retail, but I know that would be easy to replicate in downtown Cleveland on public square. And I think we, this is an opportunity for us to come together with a very detailed purpose. 
and that's to create more minority businesses in the downtown area, bring them from the neighborhoods and let them also operate downtown. So I thank Larice for joining. I thank Michael for helping um, that committee as well because we have a lot of work to do. Well, it's, a, it's a, a huge shared goal for, for all of us at, at DCA. And, and you, you alluded to, um, you know, that the, the potential impact on uh, being able to attract uh, more diverse conferences and, and conventions. And that's something that we're, we're working on uh, with Destination Cleveland and, and in the early stages of doing that, because we, we fully recognize, you know, is it, it's not just, you know, the right thing to have the diversity of the downtown businesses uh, reflect the diversity of uh, uh, the greater city and, and the, the greater county. Uh, but it, it goes back to not just the right thing to do. You know, it's, it, it's the economically prudent thing to do. It's going to attract more conferences and conventions. It's going to attract more, uh, more uh, young people uh, to downtown that want right. a more diverse and inclusive experience. So uh, we, we share that goal. We're excited about, you know, working on that with, with you and, uh, Larice, maybe I'd, I'd yes. pivot over to you. Uh, obviously, this is in, in your wheelhouse. You're, you're a downtown business. Uh, you, you've held the real Black Friday event on, on Public Square for uh, the last several years. Uh, I guess I'd pose the, the same question to you. You know, what are what are the opportunities uh, that you see and and the role that downtown uh, as a place can play in uh, addressing the issues we're talking about? I'm glad, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, so no, um, definitely we, for the last couple of years, we've been able to host the expo we do annually uh, on the center of the city, um, Public Square, beautiful, one of the, the best places in our community, I think, well built and um, really creates a lot of opportunity for our city. Um, but let me back up for a second, um, if, you, if you would allow me to, uh, one about the committee, um, I'll say, you know, we're, we're definitely talking, I'm excited that we're talking about a lot, a lot of the solutions and things that we're looking forward to moving towards. But what I'm excited about is one, um, for us to discover out what, what the problems are and the barriers that have been created prior to these conversations, because you can't get to a solution until you figure out what the problem is. Um, and, and, I, and when I think about even um, being given the opportunity, I think about someone I would consider myself you know, to have a little bit of access um, to a few decision makers here in this city. And I think about the challenges that I've been faced with as a small business owner uh, within this community, being a, a business owner in downtown Cleveland, uh, one of, uh, what is it, Jonathan, I think you sent me 473 um, biz retail businesses, less than 10 are black owned in a predominantly black, um, you know, city. Um, so that's one, that's one thing we have to address and say, uh, if we want to talk about equity and inclusion um, is one issue. Um, other is, again, having a little access and still having some of the barriers. That's not been an easy um, situation hosting that on, you know, public square and some of the challenges that, that I've been faced with. So it can be a discouragement um, to those even maybe listening um, that have considered putting a business here. So, so I'm excited about being able to hear the voice um, and, and survey the individuals that are being affected and then asking the, the one to 10 businesses that are down here, what is their experience being down here? Mm -hmm. um, like I told you, Michael, you don't have to go far if you wanna know what, is, what it looks like to experience being black and having a business in downtown Cleveland, I, I'm right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can answer what those challenges look like. So again, I'm excited to be working with Teresa and her team on that committee, we've had some very engaging conversations. So I know we'll get to some great solutions. Um, so, so again, um, that has been an excitement. And, and it's what, what I think is exciting about doing that event, and as I've done them over the last seven years, it's about exposure. Because we know people don't know what they don't have access to until they've been exposed to something. And we can live right here in our community. I had someone tell me, Hey, I got accepted to Kent. Uh, someone very close to me said I was accepted to Kent State University. Um, I did not go, and I didn't realize until I became an adult that it was only 45 minutes from my house. 
Um, and because some turmoil happened at home, they stayed home, they didn't go. And that's the same thing that happens in our community. Some people don't leave 131st and Harvard. Some people don't leave, you know, 93rd and Kinsman to come down into this beautiful space that we built. So again, exposure is, is a dangerous thing, but it can be good as well. And I think, you know, that that's what the Real Black Friday has tried or attempted to do. Um, therefore, prior to Public Square, we did it at Edgewater because the Metro Parks took over and they beautified this beautiful beach. And all I remember is walking over needles growing up, if we're going to be honest today. <laughs> um, and now to this place being beautiful, exceptional, uh, um, a place that our community should be proud of, just like Public Square. So um, that's what we'll continue to do as an organization is, is try to be one of many um, institutions or organizations that We'll just continue to provide access and make people aware of what's great in our community. Marsha, I'd, I'd like to come back to you and, and maybe ask uh, uh, one more question before we turn it uh, over uh, to the audience and see what uh, questions we have coming in. Uh, and you talked a little bit about uh, uh, the Urban League co-chairing the, uh, the effort on recognizing racism as a public health issue. I wondered if you know you could elaborate even further on, you know, what whether there are uh, action steps in the pipeline or if there are, you know, what your hopes are uh, for that process, and you know, if there are things that uh, all of uh, us uh, uh, on the panel can be doing, and or if there are things that our audience uh, can engage in as well, what some of those things might be. Certainly, uh, Mike, I'll be happy to do that, but I, I do want to um, just piggyback on something that uh, my colleague Teresa talked about in terms of the whole pop-up idea, pop-up store idea, and funding. In 2016, when the Republican National Convention was here, the Urban League had the privilege of developing a pop-up store right outside of, of course, what is now Rocket Mortgage Field House. Mm -hmm. And we had 11 businesses, um, minority businesses that were in that pop-up tent. And we were able to put together funding for them to be able to have sufficient inventory and pay people to staff that day. And it was very successful. And I will tell you that every one of those vendors who received a loan have paid their loan back within 60 to 90 days of that event. So that idea is one that is spot on and is very, very doable. Well, I, I, I would, yeah, that, that's great. I, I, I would, I'd love to uh, think about, you know, whether there might be a, a similar strategy for brick and mortar. Uh, and whenever we get back to doing uh, big events, <laughs> We'd love to talk with you about, you know, pop-up strategies around uh, events as well, but uh, Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds yeah, like a, a great model to build off of. And it's, and rather than reinventing the wheel, we just improve on what's already been in place. Absolutely. And Michael, before Marsha answers her question, can I go back to Larice? Of course. Because we talk about exposure and access. So I grew up in East Cleveland. Um, mm -hmm back in the day. How do we give exposure? How do people get it? Because I necessarily did not hang out downtown. I might take the rapid back and forth. That was my exposure. Otherwise it was just my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I, and you know, and I had that east side, west side mentality of going across the bridge where I was not welcomed, not welcomed in little Italy. But a lot of us still have that. Mm -hmm. Even though I have a lot of exposure, I mm -hmm. today I'm very blessed that way. But how do we expose others to what we have been able to experience? Because there's not always a cost to it. It's free. A lot of museums are free. You mm -hmm. know, public transportation may not be as good as we will want it to like go drop us off at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame door. But Larice, what's your experience and the vendors you work with in helping give expose people to more things? in downtown west side etc i i think a couple um things one um is i i challenge myself and other leaders that i speak to on a regular basis that if we have access to the table we got to make sure and i know you both do a great job of that of making sure we bring our community with us 
Um, and, and we hold those organizations that I get to sit on the board with or be in leadership capacity roles with uh, making sure that the communities that usually don't have access to those particular organizations do. But I think strategically, and Teresa, I think we talked about this in our last meeting, um, our committee meeting was making sure strategically that we get the influencers. You grew up in East Cleveland. It was somebody that was the OG in East Cleveland. Am I right? <laughs> you know, and yes. you think it right now. Yes. You think it like, well, I know who that was. <laughs> and, and it's if you if you have him or her, you have that whole community. And I think strategically, um, at some table, sometimes we only bring the people that we tend to be comfortable with. That's natural. It's not a negative thing. It's natural. You know, we're comfortable there. Um, but I think in order to be innovative is we have to go to the community. We have to hit the ground like the Urban League does. You know, a few other organizations in our community, they hit the community. They go into trenches and, and talk to individuals. So we, we got to go and get those influencers for those particular communities and really let them be the voice for their own community. Because we can't think because we've been given access that we're the voice for everybody. Where, where I, I would be wrong to say I'm the voice of the black community. I'm not. Because there's somebody in East Cleveland don't know who Larise Purnell is on St. Clair that who is Larise Purnell. So I got to go get the OG from St. Clair, go get, you know, the business owner from Harvard or Kinsman or Union and bring them and let them be the voice of their own communities. It's, it's the same sense of the CDC model, Teresa. Um, it's a reason those were planted throughout the community. They're their own governmental institutions within that that understand the areas that surround them the same thing with those leaders. Um, who better to, to know how to assess them or access them or provide information? They'll tell you how to deliver. No, social media is our area. No, billboards are our area. No, show up to Wood Hill. That's where we all play on the basketball court or we're at the skating ring. That's where all everybody's going to be. So again, I think that's how we engage in a more innovative way. Um, it's simple, free. We just got to, you know, and, and if I could just jump in there also, I think that we ought to charge our out of school time providers, our churches who provide out of school time support, that that because so many times um, they may be struggling with what to provide for young people, helping them to understand that connecting them to opportunities and exposure is what helps them to begin to dream. Because when they can see something that they don't normally see and experience it, when they're, they get to go downtown to an Indians game or to a Cavs game, once you know those things open up, um, they're able to come downtown to go to the library downtown or any of those kinds of things, then they can begin to understand that they fit and that they have a place in those spaces. And so I think that that's really um, a job for our whole community, but particularly out of school time spaces are really, really rich for that. And programs, you know, like the Urban League and, all, and lots of other programs like that who do education and youth development. I mean, we, you know, we take our students on college tours. You know, we take our students, you know, to um, other cities to see things because we know that once they can see something beyond those five blocks where they live, they can begin to dream bigger than just what they're bound by right then and there. And as a first generation uh, student, I didn't grow up in East Cleveland, but I was close to Risa. I was in the Glenville area. So, I mean, I had the same situation. Nobody had gone to college. Nobody had, you know, done a lot of things that, you know, I've been privileged to do. But I made a decision that in my generation, poverty stops in my generation. Lack of uh, influence stops for my family in my generation. And it's up to me to make sure we begin with our families and beyond to make those things happen. Mike, Mike can I add, Michael, can I add something to that? Of course. Yeah. Please. So, I'm going to give you an example of something, and I got to see how some of the most influential people that we would say, Jonathan, on social media would consider to be influencers. So we did a, a meetup over at the Cleveland Greater Sports Commission, 
with Dave Gilbert, right? And I, what I did was I got who I, you know, some of the individuals who I thought were influential within their different industries. So from, you know, restaurants to salons to barbershops and ministry, just, and, and we brought about 35 people to the room. And I said, do a presentation of the events that we have going on in the city and the major projects that we have going on in the city. And I'm saying this was 35 individuals that may probably have over a million, two million followers on social media that were unaware of probably 99% of the things happening in our city. Wow. So, so again, yeah. we, we got to start there. So when we start, you know, cause one thing what we will do as a community and we should, it's how we make money within our convention centers and, and alike. We'll, we'll bring someone in and we will tour them and show them, put our best foot forward and yeah, we'll expose them. But we have people right here in this community yeah. that can be our biggest ambassadors that could really make this a destination city. So we just, when we talk about uh, being inclusive, we got to give people access and expose them to what great things. Cause you hear a lot of times that, you know, I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to move and don't realize people are trying to flock when they discover the greatness of the city. So that's good. That is a great example and, and really, really well put. Um, so Michael, you, you had a question. I know we moved on time. I really like the way this other question, uh, question went though. No, I love it. This is great. But, but I only want to say one thing in answer to your question, because I really language is so important. It is racism as a public health crisis. Crisis is very different than issue. So Absolutely. I, I want to make sure that we're saying that because that raises the level, okay, of uh, importance to it. It raises the level of attention to it and the sense of urgency. And so, you know, both of these projects will be um, sending information out to the community about how they will be engaging. Uh, each of the projects have a little bit different focus that they're, you know, uh, pursuing, but we will be talking to the community about how to be able to get engaged. Terrific. Uh, and th this is, uh, I, I love how this uh, uh, conversation has uh, unfolded and we're, we're already creeping up on, on our hour, which is, uh, which is great. Uh, but Jonathan, I wondered if you could maybe pick out one or two good questions coming in from the audience uh, to share with the panel. Okay, um, sure. So the first question um, kind of relates to uh, something that you mentioned, Teresa, you said that, you know, you've experienced challenges in corporate America. Um, and so the question is, how do you advocate um, for more equitable workplaces um, in, in work environments where some of your fellow colleagues and, and, and uh, employees don't, don't recognize the, the significance of, you know, equity? So that's a great question. And um, I'm going to piggyback on what Larissa said. It's about being at the table and it's about using your voice. We have, you have to use your voice and you have to use your voice to effectuate change. Otherwise people are comfortable doing what the same old thing all the time. And there is success. You can be successful, but you have to push that envelope and show people the opportunities that they're missing. And one main example, when you lose for law, I've always been a practicing lawyer, but when you lose a lawyer, um, a person, a lawyer of color, you lose all that training you just invested. It does hurt your bottom line because now you have to reinvest, rehire someone else. When I was at um, City of Cleveland as law director, that was the most diverse law department in the city. We had so, so much diversity. It was amazing and it was great because when you're helping a client solve their problems and you bring those diverse perspectives, it, it makes it easier for problem solving because basically the law is the law, it's black letter. But how do you come up with creative solutions? Throughout my career, and not everyone is comfortable doing this, but I've been able to use my voice. As a young associate, maybe I wasn't as loud as I am today, but today I am loud because 
I'm, I'm confident in my skin. I'm confident in what I do. And I know it's the right thing to do. And sometimes you just have to let others know it's the right thing to do. And again, that whole Amy Cooper situation, that just triggered so much in my career of people I've dealt with who've done the same thing. Um, and it's worked. And, you know, I tell my mentees, you know, if you're in a place where you're not being treated right, you don't fit within the culture, it's time to find a new job. And that's okay to do. Because some people, they're just, that's their culture, they're happy, they will never change. But I want to be happy in my job. I want to help more people who look like me. And as a young girl growing up in East Cleveland, I was reading the Cleveland Press, if you guys remember that newspaper. And in reading that newspaper, that's when I decided I wanted to be a Delta because it was a national organization of black females. And I thought that was amazing. And I wanted to be a lawyer to help black owned businesses. And I've accomplished both goals. So I used my voice and stuck to my plan. Okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, our next question is, what in your opinion are the most important considerations for not only making downtown more inclusive, but more equitable, whether it be for residents, workers, tourists, business owners, et cetera? And that's for, you know, anyone on the panel. I think that's a question for Larice because you're on mute, but it's about the Mrs. Mockaby. No, she was, she looked, she, she was, she was ready. I saw Miss Mockaby, she, <laughs> she unmuted, she was ready. I'm gonna let you go, ladies first, yes. I was just gonna say, I think a, a summation of a lot of the things that we've talked about already is that first of all, the decision-making tables have to be expanded so that there are equitable voices at the decision-making table. Not coming late to the party when the decisions have already been made just to hear about it and rubber stamp it, but really being a part of the beginning processes. Additionally, the resources have to be distributed equitably in order to allow all businesses to be able, and when we say equity, I think that's the other thing people have to understand. Equity is about meeting a business at the point of its need and giving it what it needs to run the race in the same way that others are running in the race. So that doesn't mean giving everybody the same thing. So the equity issue is really, really, really huge. And then really from a leadership perspective in our city, we have to have the voices of our leadership and everything that is done and said that supports the notion that diversity and equity really make good business practice and helps the bottom line. Larisse. Jeez, look, why, why do we keep, look, I'm not going after you no more. <laughs> I should have went, Teresa. She, she, you, you let me go. I should have went. Uh, but since you threw it, I'm going to start on a funny note first and just say I, I am a proud man of Alpha Phi Alpha since you wanted to make sure we were clear you were a Delta. So uh, I want to make sure I say that. But uh, but no, seriously, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine say just kind of getting, you know, perspective on what a more inclusive downtown would look like or what that would take. And he said something to me that resonated. He said, when your child does something wrong, you, in order to see change, there has to be what? Consequences, right? Um, and accountability. So for me, what I would say just to add, because Ms. Mockby said it so well, there has to be accountability. Um, and we have to make sure we, we talk about what's not taking place, organizations, I, you know, we won't get into that, but we know that there's an issue with, you know, in, um, being inclusive within, you know, a lot of corporate spaces in our community. So that has to be addressed. Um, and then there has to be consequences to that, you know, um, and I know sometimes when you hear the word consequence, you think the worst uh, things, but, but just accountability and, mm -hmm. and things to challenge people to affect change. So, and, and it goes back to what Teresa and I said, you know, if we're at the table, 
um, as leaders in this community. Marsha said it good. You have to expand the table. The tables need to be expanded. Workforce needs to be expanded. The C-suite needs to be expanded. Um, so we can keep going on and on, you know, from that perspective. But but I, I appreciate Ms. Mock B, you said it so well. And Michael, if I can add one, bring it all together. Please. I love my Marsha's definition of equity. What is equitable? And our committee is not named diversity and inclusion. It's racial equity and inclusion. That means everyone should be included. It's not about diversity, which so many people think diversity, they hear it and think just it's counting numbers. Who's at the table, what color you are, and usually it's black. But it's racial equity and, and inclusion and it's building wealth. Because even though you may have that pop-up downtown, which I'm loving the idea for big events that we do this on a regular basis, your brick and mortar may still be in the neighborhood but you're building more wealth for your family and for your community. To me, that's what it's all about. And expanding the table, bringing more people to the table and using your voice is part of it. And Marsha, I love what you said about meeting people where they are, because that's the thing. We try to treat everyone the same and they're not the same, but it's taking a deeper dive into their books, their experience. What are you good at? Where, where do you need help? and then providing those resources. Well, I, I feel like we could keep going uh, on and on. This has been a terrific hour and, and this is a terrific discussion. I also feel like that may be the perfect place to end the hour. Uh, I, I, I really appreciate all of the, the time uh, that you've uh, shared with us today, the, the insights, the ideas, uh, and I think some real tangible things that we can pick up uh, and work on together uh, going forward. Uh, so I, Teresa, Marsha, Larice, I really, really want to thank you. Uh, some of the issues that we've talked about today, uh, I, I want to emphasize the census. Uh, it's unclear how many days are left, but there's still time. <laughs> Uh, uh, please uh, fill out the, the, the census. Uh, if we have uh, folks who have not filled it out, fill it out. If you're in a position, uh, you're a property manager, you're a building owner to make sure that the enumerators have access, please give them access. That count is so, so important to not just downtown, but our entire city and region. And uh, the voter registration deadline we've talked about a couple of times is coming up October 5th. Uh, please, there's still time to register. It's very easy. Uh, to do uh, online if you have access to a computer. Uh, if not, please make your way to the library. You can do it from there. You can uh, do it via uh, paper through the Board of Elections and, and the mail as well. Uh, and make a plan to vote. Uh, early voting starts on October 6th. It can be done in person at the Board of Elections. Uh, you can request uh, a mail-in ballot uh, for any reason in, in Cuyahoga County, uh, or you can vote uh, on election day, but I think the, the most important thing that, that we've been advocating for at Downtown Cleveland Alliance, and I think our guests have been advocating for, is make a plan to vote. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to thank our audience. I'd like to thank Jonathan for uh, all of his support and, and work and putting the webinar together. And once again, Marsha, Teresa, Larice, thank you so very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes.